Number five. On October 2, 2018, 59-year-old Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist and a Washington Post columnist, entered the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. It would be the last time he was seen alive. On October 22, a leaked surveillance video has emerged that appears to show a man leaving the Saudi consulate by the back door, wearing Khashoggi's clothes, a fake beard and glasses in an attempt to impersonate him. CNN aired the footage, citing a Turkish official who identified the man as Mustafa al-Madani, a body double and member of a 15-man Saudi team that flew to Istanbul on October 2, knowing Khashoggi would arrive for a document he needed to get married. At 57, Madani is around the same height, build and age as the journalist. He is a decade older than the other said to be members of the hit team. Earlier footage from the day shows a clean-shaven Madani entering the consulate, wearing a blue and white checkered shirt and dark blue trousers. When he left hours later, he was wearing an entirely different outfit. Clothes Khashoggi had worn on his way in, but wearing the same pair of trousers that he had arrived in. The footage was handed to the CNN news channel by Turkish authorities and was later leaked to the public. Madani walks out of the consulate via its back exit with an accomplice, then takes a taxi to Istanbul's famed Blue Mosque, where he goes to a public bathroom, changes back out of the clothes, and leaves. He later eats dinner with his accomplice and goes back to a hotel, where footage shows him smiling and laughing. The apparent Saudi aim was for the footage of the man to be picked up by CCTV and distributed, thereby bolstering its claims made in the days after Khashoggi's disappearance on 2 October that he had left the consulate unscathed. In the days after Khashoggi vanished, Saudi officials initially insisted he had left the consulate by its back door. Meanwhile, Turkish television channel A Haber released a video, seemingly filmed by a small drone, which showed Saudi consulate employees tossing documents into a fire outside of the consulate building on 3 October, a day after Jamal Khashoggi disappeared. The identity of the individuals in the video, as well as the content of the documents they burned, remained unknown as of publication time. Turkish crime scene investigators examined a car park in Istanbul's Sultan Ghazi neighborhood, where authorities have found a vehicle belonging to the Saudi consulate. Other consulate vehicles were also searched, along with the consulate building and the Consul General's residence. Surveillance video aired by the Turkish state broadcaster, TRT, showed what Turkish security officials described as a suspicious movement in the car park, including an image of a man moving a bag from one vehicle to another. Five Turkish employees of the consulate also gave testimony to prosecutors. Istanbul's chief prosecutor had summoned 28 more staff members of the Saudi consulate, including Turkish citizens and foreign nationals, to give testimony. Some Turkish employees reportedly said they were instructed not to go to work around the time that Khashoggi disappeared. After weeks of denials, the Saudis admitted for the first time that Khashoggi, a prominent critic of the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman had been killed in a fistfight after entering the consulate to organize paperwork for his marriage. According to them, they intended to move Khashoggi back to Saudi Arabia. His fiance had been waiting for him at the front of the building. Reports suggested Saud al Qatani, an influential advisor to the crown prince, participated in a Skype call to the room in the consulate where Khashoggi was held. According to a Turkish intelligence source, 
At one point, Katani told his men to dispose of Khashoggi, saying, Bring me the head of the dog. Turkish media reports and officials maintain that a 15-member Saudi team flew to Istanbul on October 2, knowing Khashoggi would enter the consulate to get a document he needed to get married. Once he was inside, the Saudis accosted Khashoggi, cut off his fingers, killed and dismembered him. According to a documentary aired by Al Jazeera Arabic, Jamal Khashoggi's body was likely burned in a large oven at the Saudi Consulate General's residence. Turkish authorities monitor the burning of the outdoor furnace as bags, believed to be carrying Khashoggi's body parts, were transferred to the Saudi consul's home after he was killed inside the consulate a few hundred meters away. According to Al Jazeera, the large furnace, which could withstand temperatures of more than 1,000 degrees Celsius, was constructed weeks before Khashoggi's death. Turkish authorities believe that after he was strangled to death, his body was dismembered with a bone saw, and parts were taken to the address and burned. Bags of meat were also cooked in the oven after the killing in order to cover up the cremation of the Saudi writer's body. Turkish authorities also believe that the burning of Khashoggi's body took place over a period of three days. Turkish investigators also found traces of Khashoggi's blood on the walls of the Saudi consul's office after removing paint that the assassination team applied after killing him. Number 4 On August 11, 2012, at a football party in Steubenville, Ohio, a 16-year-old girl was allegedly raped by multiple athletes as she lay unconscious. On January 1, 2013, because of social media, horrific details of the case have been leaked to the masses, inspiring a call for increased accountability and a protest. While two boys were arrested and charged in relation to the alleged rape, several others had been accused of playing a role in the crime either by watching without intervening or disseminating photographs of the attack. Due to the small town's close-knit nature, accusations of a cover-up have emerged. According to various reports, an alleged rape crew dragged the young girl from party to party before she finally passed out. Testimony from witnesses suggests that she faced multiple sexual assaults while she was unconscious. One tweet suggests she may have been urinated on. The victim did not realize she had been raped until she heard about the photographs and then saw the images. One image shows two football players carrying the girl, who has now been identified because she is a minor, by her hands and ankles as she hangs limp above the ground. The New York Times reported that another image shows her lying naked on the floor. Nightsec, an arm of the hacker collective that specifically targets rapists, demanded a public apology be issued to the young woman and warned that it would release personal information of big red football players and staff who have defended the accused young men. No apology was issued by the hacker's deadline of January 1. That day, a video was leaked of a teenage boy who appears to be speaking moments after the rape occurred. She is so raped, he laughs, continuing an offensive tirade, including the lines, they raped her quicker than Mike Tyson, and they raped her more than the Duke lacrosse team. Grossly quipping, that the unconscious girl was deader than Trayvon Martin. Even as other voices captured in the video interject, saying, that's not cool, bro. That's like rape. It is rape. They raped her. Other teens in the video laugh along. Police released a statement following the video's release, stating that they were already aware of the footage and had interviewed the young man who made the video, but did not comment further. Adding to the anonymous-led conspiracy theory is that Steubenville high head coach 
Reno Sakosha did not bench or in any way suspend the players involved. Anonymous leads also claimed to have uncovered additional information suggesting a cover-up. While the county prosecutor and the judge in the case rescued themselves because of their ties to the football team, the hackers say there are more attackers as well as more victims. Moreover, they claim the alleged rape occurred at prosecutor Jane Hanlon's home and that her son may have been involved. They also point to ties between Steubenville law enforcement and the football team. If one thing is clear from the video, it's that the boys who committed, witnessed, or heard about the rape found it funny. Dubbing themselves the Rape Crew, they certainly understood that what happened was indeed rape. To the dismay of many, most of them appear to have gotten away with participating, watching, or disseminating pictures of the attack. Some locals have said that the lack of punishment is linked to the boys' football celebrity in an increasingly poor town. Number 3 In June 26, 2017, a video has emerged purporting to show torture methods used by North Korean security agents while interrogating suspects. The clip, which surfaced on LiveLeak, shows one agent repeatedly asking a woman if she has had sex with Chinese men. Her hands are bound behind her back as she is thrown around, kicked, and slapped. At one point, he grabs her by the hair before ramming her face into a wall where there is a red marking, which appears to be blood. The video was uploaded to the website in 2012. It also shows another agent shoving a stick in between a man's legs and the chair he is sitting on. He is then slapped across the face and punched in the back of the head. He was allegedly accused of ripping up a photo of Kim Jong-il, the former leader of North Korea. The video has surfaced in the wake of the death of U.S. student Otto Warmbier. Earlier in that month, the 22-year-old was medically evacuated from North Korea after it emerged he had been in a coma since the start of his 15-year sentence for stealing a propaganda poster in 2016. Warmbier's family and officials have pointed blame at the regime's treatment of him, but North Korea has denied any wrongdoing, calling themselves the biggest victim. Number 2 On December 26, 1996, John Benet Ramsey was found dead in the basement of her family home in Boulder, Colorado. She was just six years old. Although many people have become persons of interest in the case over the past 22 years, no one has ever been charged with her murder. John Bonet was born on August 6, 1990 in Atlanta and was the youngest child of John and Patsy Ramsey. She had an older brother named Burke who was nine years old at the time of the murder. When the family moved to Boulder, Colorado, John Bonet began participating in child beauty pageants Winning titles such as America's Royale Miss, Little Miss Charlevoix, and Little Miss Colorado, John Bonet got a brand new bicycle as a Christmas gift that year. After trying out her bicycle for the first time, John Bonet and the rest of the family had gone for dinner at a friend's home. When the Ramseys returned home that evening, John carried a sleeping John Bonet up to her room, and Patsy helped put her to bed. But that was the last time they saw their daughter alive. The next morning, John Bonet was reported missing. Eight hours later, her body was discovered in the basement. She had been murdered. Her mother Patsy claimed she found a ransom note in their kitchen and called the police before John Bonet's body was discovered. Forensics teams initially believed she had been kidnapped and cordoned off her bedroom, not realizing her body was in the basement of the home. John and family friend, Fleet White, found her body, with John immediately picking her up and bringing her upstairs, which many said altered the forensic evidence available. The autopsy revealed that John Bonet had been killed by strangulation and a skull fracture. 
There was no evidence of conventional rape, although sexual assault was not ruled out due to injuries found on her body. A garrote made from a length of nylon cord and the broken handle of a paintbrush owned by Patsy Ramsey was tied around John Bonet's neck. Pieces of pineapple were found in her stomach, which investigators believed she had eaten a few hours prior to her death. Photographs found in the house from that day showed a bowl with pineapple in it, but neither of her parents remembers feeding it to John Bonet. Nine-year-old Burke Ramsey's fingerprints were found on the bowl. Patsy and John both maintained that Burke was asleep throughout the whole thing. Suspicion immediately fell on the family. A ransom note found at the scene raised more questions than answers. The three-page note, which was handwritten, claimed to be from a foreign faction that was demanding money for the return of John Bonet. The note asked for $118,000 to avoid harm befalling the child. The sum was the exact amount of John's bonus that year. In a twist, the pages used for the ransom note had been torn from a pad that Patsy kept by the telephone. There were also a lack of footprints in the snow around the home, suggesting it may have been someone already in the home. A jury voted in 1999 to charge John and Patsy with child abuse, resulting in the death of their daughter. But the charges were never pursued, and DNA evidence taken from John Bonet's clothes later cleared them both. The DNA came from an unknown male and could not be matched to anyone who had been near the scene or handled John Bonet's body. In 2008, the district attorney issued an apology to John and Patsy, saying they were exonerated of any criminal wrongdoing in relation to the death of John Bonet Ramsey. Patsy died of ovarian cancer at age 49 in 2006. John has since remarried and lives in the Western United States. While John and Patsy face their own battle with doubters, John Bonet's brother Burke also came under suspicion. In a controversial CBS television show that aired in September 2016, forensic pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz said there was a reason to believe the then nine-year-old struck John Bonet with a heavy flashlight and accidentally killed her. He suggested that John Bonet took a slice of pineapple from Burke's late-night snack, prompting him to lash out with a nearby torch. Sleuths investigating the death for the TV show claimed Burke had a history of scatological problems. They cited the evidence of a housekeeper who said excrement the size of a grapefruit was once smeared on John Bonet's bedsheets and behavioral experts who earlier suggested Burke could have killed his sister in a peak of rage after she nicked some of his midnight snacks, said he had mental issues around the time. When Patsy Ramsey called the police to report her daughter's death on December 26, 1996, the telephone operator Kim Archuleta described her as frantic and panicked. In 2016, nearly 20 years after the John Bonet Ramsey's murder, new technology has unearthed a conversation that followed after Patsy thought she'd hung up the phone. That conversation, which appears to happen with two or three other people, has been shown in the docu-series The Case of John Bonet Ramsey. We're not speaking to you, a male voice, which is believed to be John Ramsey, can be heard explaining. What did you do? Help me, Jesus, a female voice believed to be Patsy responds. What did you find? A child's voice thought to be Burke asks. The family has always insisted Burke was in bed at the time of the grim discovery. Reflecting on that fateful phone call, 911 operator Kim Archuleta noted the change in tone from when Patsy was on the phone to when Patsy thought she had hung up the phone. According to Kim Archuleta, she heard Patsy saying, Okay, we've called the police, now what? So I remained on the phone, trying to listen to what was being said. It sounded like there were two voices in the room, maybe three, different ones. I had a bad feeling about this. To me, it sounded rehearsed, Kim Archuleta said. Most shockingly, 
The docu-series also leaked a disturbing video revealing JonBenet's brother, Burke, telling a child psychologist what he thought had happened to his sister back in 1997. The video recording of Burke's 1997 interview was aired for the first time ever, showing him talking about his sister's death in a disturbingly carefree way. When asked what he thinks happened to his sister in the interview, Burke says, Someone took her very quietly, tiptoed down the basement, then he took a knife out and went. Then he goes on to making a stabbing motion and says, you know, something like that. Or maybe a hammer hit her in the head, maybe. Besides the response seeming rehearsed and unnervingly detailed, the fact Burke shows no appropriate emotions about his sister's passing, and on top of that, acts out the stabbing and hitting he describes, makes this whole scenario very uncomfortable to watch. While CBS stressed at the end of the show, the case is still unresolved and asked viewers to make up their own minds, it's hard not to think of Burke as a suspect after watching the video. Burke filed lawsuits against CBS totaling $750 million after the finger was pointed at him for his little sister's death. Burke appeared on Dr. Phil to clear his name after the CBS documentary came out. He dismissed the claims that he bludgeoned his sister in an interview on The Dr. Phil Show. But the 29-year-old was heavily criticized for his creepy body language as he appeared to smile while recounting the night his sister's body was found. In January 2019, the lawsuit with CBS was settled for an undisclosed amount. Number 1 On April 18, 2013, a leaked video posted online shows Syrian government forces beating and torturing unarmed Alawite officers who have allegedly been accused of smuggling weapons to the Syrian opposition. The video clip uploaded by activists shows a reporter from the official Syrian TV channel present during the Syrian forces' interrogation. Officers can be heard asking the men, who have been placed in large metal containers, questions about their alleged involvement while slapping them repeatedly. The three Alawite officers in the video were blindfolded and handcuffed while swearing to God that they did not sell any weapons and ammunition to the opposition fighters, but the officers don't believe them and continued to torture them. 